Hello and welcome. Before we start our conference, I would like to uh, point out uh, that we will have translation available in Korean, Spanish and Italian. So if you would look at the bottom of your screen, you will see a, a sign of a little global sign. And there you can press and find and select this language for, your, for you. Okay, that's the end of the notice. Um, so good morning, everyone. It is uh, especially to our esteemed guest speakers and to those who are tuning in from, from home, from wherever you are from all around the world, especially to our guests from Korea. Maybe some of you are uh, tuning in from our Facebook page and our social media platforms. Welcome and, and thank you for joining us. It is my great honor and privilege to welcome everyone to the 19th annual WFWP European Conference in partnership with WFWP Korea, uh, Korean Ministry of Interior and Safety, Order Min Meeting, and the Women's United Nations Research Network. Uh, we will be discussing, of course, the co-creating spaces for uh, women and for peace and reconciliation on the Korean Peninsula. What steps are women taking for sustainable peace? My name is Miti Toma. I am the Vice President of the Women's Federation for World Peace here in Europe. I am honored and privileged to be the moderator for this first session. We have an esteemed panel of speakers with a vast experience in conflict resolution and uh, peace building and creating peace spaces and also in reconciliation programs. Without any further ado, I would like to invite, introduce our first speaker, Dr. Julia Moon, who will give us the opening welcoming address. Dr. Julia Moon is, is and has been serving as the Director General of the Universal Ballet since 1996 and is the Vice Chair, Chairwoman of the Sunhack Educational Foundation and responsible for administration of the Sunhack Arts in middle and high schools and five other schools in Seoul. Our co-artistic -art director of the Kirov Academy of Ballet at Washington DC and the Universal Academy in Seoul. Recipient, she's a recipient of numerous awards including the International Society of Performing Arts and International Citation of Merit. She is the president of the Women's Federation for World Peace and she was just inaugurated in 2019. Unfortunately, on this occasion, she cannot be with us in person, but we are very honored to have a, a, a video message from her. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the co-founder of Women's Federation for World Peace, I'm very happy to welcome all of you here today and want to thank you for contributing to this very important discussion. Both Mother Moon, as she is affectionately called by many throughout the world, and her late husband, Reverend Dr. Son Myung Moon, taught that in order to create sustainable peace on the Korean Peninsula and elsewhere, we must move from a culture of conflict to a culture of heart and a culture of connectedness rather than division. This has been the focus of Women's Federation for World Peace since our founding in 1992. Government and political solutions are necessary, but must be sustained through culture and through real connections among people. Certainly, the people of Europe understand how quickly wars can break out when differences of ethnicity, nationality, or religion become paramount. After the Cold War, the European Union was formed for this reason. Since her husband's passing in 2012, Mother Moon has led an effort to promote world peace by bringing together individuals and groups beyond all historical barriers. She emphasizes that each one of us must understand the motto, peace starts with me. She has stressed the importance of loving relationships within families, societies, and nations where women play a central role alongside men. Over the past few years, 
millions of people have come together in person and through online webinars called Rallies of Hope. Most recently, world leaders joined Think Tank 2022, created by Mother Moon and chaired by former UN Secretary General Pan Ki-moon for the purpose of bringing about a peaceful reunification of the Korean Peninsula and ending all wars once and for all. The heart of a mother is connected with her children, both physically and spiritually. Mother Moon has a sense of connection with people throughout this world, and she seeks to end the suffering caused by poverty, war, and family breakdown. She teaches that ultimately, humanity must become reconnected with our source, the spiritual origin of all of us, and know that we are part of one human family. Furthermore, we must restore, protect, and preserve this beautiful planet on which we live. I am eagerly looking forward to hearing from the distinguished panelists and speakers at today's webinar. Once again, thank you very much for joining us. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Um, Julia Moon. It was a very touching to hear you share, especially the points that you mentioned. I was very moved by um, that we have to shift from the culture of a conflict to the culture of heart and the culture of connected, connectedness rather than the culture of division. I think it's a very, very important point that you raise and thank you so much. Our next, next esteemed speaker is Dr. Yang Ho Hong. He is the former Vice Minister of the Unification of Korea, President of North Korean and Social Research Center. Dr. Hong holds a master's degree in political and doctoral degree in political science and diplomacy and public administration at the National uh, uh, University. He has been a member of this, uh, several advisory committees and has uh, received a number of uh, outstanding awards. So before we in, uh, invite uh, Dr. Hong to come and share his um, thoughts, please, um, for the English speaking, because he will speak in Korean, so please um, use the translation in English. Thank you. So let us warmly welcome Dr. Hong. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. I'm the uh, Hong Young Ho. Today's my topic is is the Women's Leadership for Reconciliation and Peace, a case in North and South Korea. The history of mankind has been a process of war and peace continually repeating itself, and many people have suffered in this process. That is why intellectuals and the peace enthusiasts around the world have made various efforts in order to prevent war and institutionalization peace for the happiness of humankind. However, despite the DG effort, war and other uh, forms of conflict are still occurring in different parts of the world for reasons such as selfishness of human beings, the national leadership desire for exclusive power, the self-interest of each nation and religion's ideological nation and religion conflict adulting, and especially in Korea Peninsula. So I guess it may take a long time to resolve this conflict and the realize peace in North and South Korea, ultimately achieving the unification of the two Koreas. Korea has a long history of being a single ace nation and the two uh, Koreas have made a constant effort for reunification since the 1945. However, reconciliation and the reunification remains a difficult task due to the strong zero-sum mindset. 
brought the first by different issue, including the systemic and the ideological confrontation during the Cold War, the legitimacy of the interdependence regime in North and South Korea, and mutual hostility caused by the Korean War. South Korea took a gradual step by step and a peaceful approach to unification. Uh, South Korea pers uh, pursued a peaceful unification firmly against another war happening in the Korean Peninsula. As generally, uh, Korean, uh, South Korea believed it was reasonable to take time to go through the process of mutual homogenization because the system's ideology were different uh, between the two Koreas. Uh, therefore, they, uh, these efforts are shown through the constant communication between the authorities, non governmental interactions, and the cooperation, economic, social, and cultural aspects, the union of separated families, humanitarian assistance for those in financial need in North Korea, and the joint international cooperation. Women from both sides also interacted in this process. All these endeavors were for the reconciliation, peace, and the unification in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, interaction of uh, Korean from North and Korea uh, began in or the early 1990s. However, such inter-Korean women interactions were subjected to restriction in each center under the basic policies of the North and South Korea authorities. In particular, women from North Korea adhered to representing and implementing the North Korea authorities' official policy toward North Korea. And the service has opportunity for North and South Korean women to understand their differences and at the same time confirm their identity as a people of one ethnicity, therefore sensing the need over harmony, peace, and education between the two Koreas. This uh, potential to expand the sentence of homogeneity as well as the politicization if the interactive meeting as a, or the frequently further developing to include agenda more continuity to the woman. Unfortunately, these exchanges did not take place independently or continuously as they, as they happened as an intermittent event according to the relationship between the authorities. North Korea claim, claimed that their women are free and that their rights and interests are respected. However, it became apparent that they lived in a strict patriarchal society and lacked autonomy because they were strictly bound by the policies of the North Korean authorities. Taking into consideration the nature of inter-Korean relationships, the reality of inter-Korean interaction and cooperation, and the limitations of inter-Korean woman interactions that we have reviewed thus far, let us discuss the following. What is the significance of women leadership for reconciliation of North and South Korea, peace on the Korean Peninsula and the unification? 
Uh, first, to women's unique nature and the tendency toward the inclusiveness, nonviolence, affinity, communication, sincerity, patience, uh, patience creativity, etc., uh, are virtues necessary in resolving the confrontational and zero sum relationship between North and South and bring forth the reconciliation and peace. Second, I believe the leadership of women with such virtues can fully carry out the role of easing the conflict between North and South Korea and create a new atmosphere of reconciliation and peace. If an internationally renowned and competent woman leadership actively stepped on, she can definitely play a significant role. A third, it may be necessary to promote an international campaign urging for the conciliation and the peace in North and South Korea through international leadership level women solidarity activities. To increase the influence and the momentum, it is effective to organize an international women's network for the reconciliation and peace in the Korean Peninsula where women with the global leadership participate and internationally promote came for the unification, reconciliation, and peace in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, in the Korean Peninsula, and also uh, necessarily to uh, it would be necessary to meet the um, leadership in the North Korea, including the chairman Kim Jong-un couple and vice president Kim Yo-jong to share with them opinions of the international community. Of course, the limitations of a direct interchange in exchange between North and South Korean women cannot be resolved in a short amount of time. Therefore, it is necessary to carry out multicultural, multi National activities. People in North and South Korea would eventually have to need to directly resolve the issue on the Korean Peninsula, and it is necessary to form a gathering that integrates conservation, conservative, and liberal women panels in the country, and then promoting a meeting of North and South. Women leadership. In addition to political and the military issues, deliberating, discussing issues that can help to increase homogeneity or issues that may increase cooperation rather than conflict. For example, life, culture, or women related issues. Six, it is necessary to provide overseas training to elite women in North Korea to introduce to them the existing international educational programs or create the new programs to help them learn international norms and acquire advanced knowledge. Such education and training will be helpful in modernizing of North Korean women and the strengthening women leadership. Seven, Women leaders can train themselves in forming reconciliation, peace, and integration between North and South through communicating and cooperating with the North Korean refugee women who have successfully settled in the public of Korea. After our I hope this can be best for women's leadership to be effectively carried out in interactions between women from North and South Korea. I finish here. I will, or uh, those who participated in this event uh, can contribute to, to the unification of Korea. Thank you very much, Dr. Hyung. That was a very insightful, and it's good to hear from a male perspective about us and also about the broader view of, and understanding the different approaches to resolving a peace on the Korean Peninsula. Also in regards to how significant the role of women is in, in their leadership and also bringing their skills and feminine qualities to find solutions to real reconciliation on, to, for the two Koreas.
Thank you very much. Um, it was a very insightful um, presentation. Thank you. So our next speaker will be uh, Honorable Emanuela Del Rey. She is the former Vice Minister of the Foreign Affairs, President of the Standing Committee on the Implementation of Agenda 2030 and Sustainable Development, expert on conflict studies. Honorable Del Rey is a member of the Italian Chamber of Deputies since 2018. She is the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation in both governments one and two. Only yesterday, we are very honored actually to hear this, only yesterday, Dr. Honorable Zeli was appointed as the EU uh, Special uh, Representative for the Sachel, that's the S-A-H-L-E. It's quite a prestigious position, so we are very uh, uh, honoured to have uh, Honourable Delry with us. Let us warmly welcome Honourable Del Del Delry to, to the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm honoured to be uh, invited here because um, this topic is particularly relevant and I think that we should reflect upon this uh, in a as much as possible because despite we have achieved some results over the years, I have to say that much of the uh, issues related to women's participation in peace processes is still to be uh, addressed and especially solutions have to be designed in an inappropriate way. Thank you very much for your congratulations. I want to say that it's a bit of a, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little victory for us women because uh, three women have been nominated yesterday and not only me but also a Finnish lady and a German lady uh, to the position of special representative which means that things are changing because I am the first Italian woman to cover this position but this means that of course there is a special sensitivity in the, in the European Union regarding the role of women in these positions because uh, these positions involve a, a great deal of uh, mediation activities and also mediation skills, of course. I have to um, go straight to the topic you, we are talking about because uh, I think we should uh, uh, coming, uh, come to some important conclusions regarding what has been done so far. We have achieved a lot because uh, resolutions have been passed, as we know, 1325 just to name one, but uh, it is not only a question of uh, uh, making resolutions and uh, hope, uh, hoping to uh, make them implemented by uh, the national action plans uh, at national level and also being, uh, let's say, uh, interiorized at international level in all uh, uh, international organizations. It's not only a question of uh, making resolutions, it's a question of making resolutions constant in the narrative and I think Think that in the last few years this has happened. In fact, uh, resolutions, the principles included in resolutions have become part of the general narrative so much that today there is a general uh, understanding that the role of women is important and should be uh, enhanced and promoted. I remember, for instance, the peace process in Syria. It was a disaster. I wrote an article uh, entitled The Ghost, uh, Conflict Ghosts, because the women were not involved at all in the, com in the, in the peace process so much that they were left outside the door. And this was only a few years ago. Nowadays, the situation is changing. And I think that there is, uh, in the, at the moment, um, a special cultural change that makes uh, it possible that women are involved since the beginning of the peace process, not only in its making, because most of the times women are uh, considered, uh, let's say, something that should come at a certain point because it would be an added value. Women must be the leaders of peace processes, and we know this because uh, being um, not only the representative of their own part of the world, 
They also demonstrate by being uh, leaders in peace processes and also, uh, of course, uh, carrying out activities of mediation and negotiation, that they, they demonstrate that the, the, the interest of a specific population, a specific um, uh, context, a specific situation is uh, an affair that relates to everybody. And this is a big, important uh, starting point for peace processes because we know that once the parties acquire the, uh, the, the awareness of the importance of being uh, inclusive, this is a good start. So this is one, one thing I wanted to share with you. Of course, uh, I also want to say, considering my long experience in negotiation, uh, that we should not give for granted that women would bring a good uh, um, uh, contribution to a peace process simply because they are women. This is something that I think we should also uh, consider a mentality of the past. We must really uh, aim at quality because at the moment uh, the, the big uh, mistake, I think, the, the what I call the uh, conceptual trap is the fact that sometimes we think that it's enough to have a woman in a panel to make a panel gender balanced. balanced. And I think this is a real uh, misunderstanding uh, the role because I think we should uh, aim at quality we should start rewarding women of quality we should start uh, thinking that it's not enough to have quotas which are which is a horrible word in 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 this particular um, issue we are discussing today because it means that it's enough to have uh, uh, let's say a name and uh, a representation rather than uh, have an active representation that would really be bring the contribution the person is able to bring. This is a big thing we should discuss also amongst us women, because uh, I know for a fact, uh, I have some experience, my age tells you that probably I have uh, a, a few decades of experience now, and I can tell you that I have experienced um, the, 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 the activities with women on on field in complex situations and not not always i have been satisfied by the results or by the uh, development of the activities so this is one point i wanted to make and share with you because i think that uh, quality against quantity is something that we should really fight for especially now that we have uh, the opportunity of course, uh, this is something that we should uh, make it possible for all women in the world. We know very well that we in, uh, there are areas of the world in which there is much more understanding. And there is, uh, let's say, uh, women are much more out outspoken, have the freedom to be outspoken, because this is another important thing. And of course, uh, we know that there are uh, reluctant societies to open uh, to women's participation. Sometimes they hide behind what I was talking about before, meaning that there is a representation, at least, uh, you know, um, let's say symbolic, and therefore the, the situation has been uh, absolutely solved. This is something we have to work on very closely. We have to um, enhance our activities in uh, uh, terms of observatories. We have to be more connected among women, not only with intelligent men who, of course, share our views. And this is the time in which we can and take advantage of the sensitivity of some areas and some countries and make sure that there is an openness to share with countries and areas where this is not at all uh, being uh, interiorized. It is not easy, but with technology and with all the opportunities that we have today through, uh, of course, networking and in inclusion, I think we can achieve a lot. This is why, and I conclude, this is why I insist, I've been insisting for quite a while, on this point, we should include um, women, especially women uh, in the peace processes, but women in general, in all our decisional processes, especially in our Western countries, which they should sit together with us at our tables where we take decisions. Otherwise, we are talking about, uh, you know, let's say entities that we consider uh, important, but we do not listen to. And this is still, I think, far to come because there have been attempts, but only by sensitive, sensitive uh, areas, sensitive sensitive people, sensitive context. We need to make this a narrative that becomes the narrative of everybody in the streets, 
amongst children uh, in the schools, it must become, uh, let's say, a narrative for everybody. So I conclude by uh, saying that I will, uh, of course, continue to fight for these principles. And uh, I really thank you for organizing this seminar because a seminar like this is really very important. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Honourable Delary. That was uh, an amazing presentation. Yes, I agree that women are not just a token uh, to fulfil this quota, um, but women have something important to bring to the, the, the peace uh, table for negotiating and also contributing their feminine leadership, which is kind of lacking in society at this moment. So thank you very much for your presentation. And once again, congratulations on your prestigious appointment. Thank you. Our next speaker is Madame Exima Bartolome uh, Toshino. Uh, after 15 years as a Spanish uh, career diplomat, uh, she is uh, currently the deputy head of mission at the Spanish embassy in Mozambique. She has also a great experience in the European Union uh, she was appointed as a deputy antichi of the European Commission for four years during the Spanish presidency. So let us warmly welcome uh, Madame Tosino. Thank you. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for me to be able to participate in this event to analyze what we are already doing as women to achieve sustainable peace. And I really thank uh, the Women for Peace Association for the invitation and the trust placed in me. Uh, from my position as deputy head of uh, the Spanish embassy in Mozambique, I hope to be able to contribute with my vision from three points of views. As a diplomat of a country, Spain, so active in these matters at the national and multilateral level, as a Spanish diplomat in Mozambique, where together with my ambassador, we're putting into practice our Spanish policies on a bilateral level with Mozambique, and as a woman, wife, mother, daughter, sister, because each woman from her own role in her life can do much for peace and reconciliation. Therefore, I do believe that an issue such as sustainable peace cannot only remain on a theoretical level, uh, but I, each of us have several moments a day as people and as professionals to put it into practice. So in the first place, I represent a country, Spain, which has taken the role of woman as an engine of change so seriously that it has provided itself with various instruments at the national and international level to make its goal a reality to place gender as a cross-cutting issue in all policies. Spain has been one of the most active countries in the United Nations, so that woman peace and security agenda anchored in the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 is an agenda with practical content. For this, we have promoted the creation of informal group of experts of the Security Council together um, together with the adoption of Resolution 2242. And we have launched the network for Focal Point Network, which already has 100 focal points in all countries. And we have shared our good practices included in our second National Action Plan for Women, Peace and Security for the period 2017-2023 with specific projects that our Spanish cooperation develops in various countries. In 2019, we have also presented in, at the UN together with Finland, an initiative which is quite important, it's Commitment 2025, already signed by a lot of countries, and it establishes 10 concrete commitments um, for the states and five requests to the UN to guarantee that in 2025, the full and effective participation of women in all projects, of, of, uh, in all peace processes. Now, from a different perspective, from my work in Mozambique, with an ongoing process, in an ongoing DDR process since, 19, since 2019 carried out by the UN, I have learned that for, the, for there to be reconciliation and peace, there must be first economic justice and empowered women. Spain has also assumed the leadership of the Coalition of Action on Economic Justice and Right of the Forum for the Generation of Equality. And we will identify concrete commitments to develop in the next five years by governments and by civil society. Um, this 
projects what seek to develop is to ensure economic justice because economic justice will have to be carried out on issues such as access to decent jobs, equal access and control of resources, financing projects, digitalization. Women have to really feel the institutional support of their society and communities as women entrepreneurs and as consumers. And there must be a clear definition of their participation and implementation of economic policies. There are wonderful ideas on paper that we have to put in paper uh, into practice. And it is also very important to empower girls by promoting STEM careers, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, which, is, which are fundamental lever in the objective of the full participation of women and girls in international trade, for instance. And finally, from my third perspective, as a wife, as a mother, as a professional, life has taught me the great role of women when it comes to mediating in the face of any conflict, no matter how small, when it comes to educating positively, educating in values that we instill, instill in, our, in our children of always wanting to find a solution, thinking of others, knowing how to put ourselves in their shoes, how many global conflicts would end if each mother, wife, sister or daughter transmitted these values of solidarity, of reconciliation, of looking forward and being motivated by the future instead of teaching rancor or hatred or misunderstanding or intolerance. It has been demonstrated at the family level and at the global institutional level that when women assume leadership roles and participate in peace processes from the very beginning, a more lasting peace is achieved because they are negotiated peace processes where everyone gives something in order to achieve reconciliation and where peace is sustainable because more mutual benefits are identified. Women find more arguments that unite than arguments that divide people. Mothers and sisters and wives know very well how to counter extremist narratives or opportunistic narratives that, they, that only provoke wars. And above all, in the prevention of conflicts, through education in the family, in schools, and with their young people. Women are a lot of times the first people to notice the increase of tension that can lead to violence. And they are the first available to get involved in, re in rebuilding peace. So let us trust in the power of women when it comes to achieving reconciliation and sustainable peace, because it is really her main objective in her home. Let us give women instruments to achieve this. We will empower women so that with their self-esteem and resilience, they can truly contribute their added value to peace processes. They're already doing it in their families and in their communities. So we have the legal multilateral instruments. We have the resolutions 3025, which is the first resolution, in fact, that recognizes the disproportionate and different effects suffered by women and girls in compared to men and boys caused by armed conflicts. And also the first resolution that highlights the key role of women in the prevention and resolution of conflicts from the very beginning. So uh, also um, in the construction of consoli and consolidation of peace. So we have achieved with great success the first step, the instruments. Let us now leave this conference with uh, a commitment to activate everything that has really that really exists already in paper to put it into practice. Because if these 15 years of my professional experience have taught me something is that the world advances because of the people not because of mechanisms or resolutions or processes, because of the people, because of the attitude of whoever listens to a project proposal on the other end of the phone, or whoever is in charge of transmitting a message to his superior, or whoever is on the other side with a dossier that can either archive or activate. Everything depends on us. And I hope that we can leave this conference with a commitment to action from our role, which is often what is lacking. The instruments and resources exist. All your action is missing. And with today's event, I, I really want to pay tribute to the thousands of women and girls who risk their lives to defend women's human rights for always being in the front line to help mediate, negotiate, and prevent. Women must be the protagonists of these processes. They are great negotiators and they are very decisive. They really know what they're talking about. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much for raising so many good points and a beautiful presentation. Thank you very much. I think the point that you raised about uh, trusting women 
and when it comes to achieving reconciliation and sustainable peace. As, as you mentioned, they are already practicing it as a main objective in their own homes. So it's not something that is far away, but it's something that is already very close to women's heart. Yeah, I want to give, um, also I think women need more opportunities uh, to be able to contribute into peace building and be at the negotiating uh, tables where they can really come up with uh, sustainable policies and also um, policies that can really benefit all. I think women's leadership is very much le needed in this area. Of course, we don't discriminate against our men folks. We really do want to support them. But also, I think women's leadership is, is now um, so vitally needed. So thank you very much again once for your presentation. Thank you. So um, thank you. Uh, now we have uh, the Mira team uh, presenting a survey of the Korean youth on reunification. The Mira team is a project of the Women's Federation for World Peace in Korea, which is aimed towards the uh, youth of to the 20s and 30s based on uh, the Women's Federation for World Peace uh, a vision to realize a one global family rooted in the culture of sustainable peace. They are planning to activities to foster the next generation of women and to uplift positive influence on the Korean society. It's very exciting to hear a youth perspective on uh, reunification of the, the two Koreas. So let us welcome Ms. Yeon Ju Yu and Ms. Tamami Nozui. Thank you. So, um, thank you. Um, good day to all of you. We are the MIRA team, and the MIRA is a project of Women's Fed Korea, which is aimed for young people aged from 20s and 30s. The title of our presentation is Perceptions on Korean Reconciliation Among 20s and 30s of Youth. It is our pleasure to present our results here. So shall we begin? There are ongoing studies on reconciliation in Korea, specifically on generation gaps. However, it is still vague to comfort that younger generations prefer reconciliation over reunification. So the purpose of the survey is to find out the perspectives of Korean reunification among young generations. We wanted to know whether people think the UN and NGO are important organizations in the reunification movement. And furthermore, we include the statement focused on the role of women. Based on our results, we came up with action plans that can be practiced in real life since it is relatively less addressed in the previous research. Therefore, we came up with the three main topics and two action plans that can put in action to achieve a step forward to reconciliation of Korea. Based on the given topics and action plans, we came up with the following results. First, we looked into pros and cons of reunification among youth. Most youth are suggesting reunification for peace and economic development as the following. However, economic differences at the same time makes them concerned whether there might be increase of tax or a sacrifice of the younger generation. The second main topic is about the importance of the UN and NGO as supportive organizations for unification. Participants were aware of the important role of the UN and NGO in achieving reunification. However, they were not quite sure what the organizations were actually doing to achieve peace. Based on the following, we would like to carefully suggest ways to promote or publicize the work of UN and NGO for reunification. Furthermore, there needs to be more field research to find out participants who would like to volunteer or be part of the NGO groups. And our remaining presentation will be discussed by one of our Damira team members, Tamami. 
Yes, we also ask a question about the importance of women's role on Korean reunification. 82.5% of respondents answered important and 17.5% answered not important. Although some participants emphasize that it is not necessary to separate the role between men and women in the peace movement. But we could find out most of the respondents do not recognize the role for reunification itself. We thought it would be a first step to figure out what is being done in the reconciliation movement in different areas and what could be the role for ourselves. Based on the discussion from our survey, we considered two action plans. One of our action plan is to develop a platform in order for youth to communicate and share the ideas for reunification. In future, we hope that the platform becomes the place for South and North women and youth. Since now it is difficult to meet in person and interact with North Korean people, we plan the action that we could start at this time. So plan two is to launch a project to support North Korean women and youth. One is for South Korean and one is for North Korean. For South Korean women and youth, we thought education is the most important action for our next generation so that we understand each other through learning our differences. And actual support is also important for North Korean people. For example, we can, stand, we can send sanitary napkins or make, make reusable clothes pads. In our survey, there are many answers and suggestions to, to support North Korean women. But here are some possible plans for the Mirror team could work on. And we think it would be great if we could work with other NGOs together and develop our project as well. The Mirror, the Mirror team is open for suggestion from our presentation and we welcome NGOs who are interested in, in making a better place for our future generation. So this is the end of our presentation. Thank you, thank you for listening. Thank you so much uh, to the Mira team. Actually, it's a very important uh, um, project. Uh, we need the engagement of young people in order to make a change. Um, we know the historical difficulties uh, with the reunification of the two Koreas, but we need the young people to have a much more positive outlook and also to have these statistics. They really do help us to gauge where we are uh, aiming towards. I think that um, young people um, are much more, not they don't have so much baggage uh, about the historical difficulties that Korea has been through. And young people are seeking for more reunification uh, ways of uh, moving forward. So thank you so much. This is a very, very important project that you're doing. And I hope that more NGOs can really uh, engage with this project. Thank you. So for our final but not least speaker is by our beautiful Dr. Liang Yang Moon. Uh, why I say that? Because uh, I have uh, been working with Dr. Yang, Liang Yang Moon for many years and I know she is uh, such a beautiful person who has worked so hard and tirelessly for the Women's Federation for over a number of years. Anyway, um, she is the co-chair of uh, Korean Reconciliation a Council of Korean Reconciliation and Corporation and Joint Representative. She is the Senior uh, Advisor for the Women's Federation for World Peace. Dr. Liang Yang Moon is the Secretary General of Women's Federation for six years and the International President and Korean President for 14 years. She has visited North Korea 19 times. Um, she's also, because of her concern for reconciliation and a peace re, re, peaceful re, reunification of the two Koreas. And um, uh, we are very uh, fortunate that uh, she will be uh, giving a video presentation to us today. So 
we can enjoy what she has to share with us. Thank you. Distinguished guests, leaders and members of WFWP Europe, I am very pleased to share with you some of my experiences for reconciliation and unification on the Korean Peninsula in this meaningful event. In 1992, when the co-founders, Reverend Sun Myung Moon and Dr. Hak Ja Han Moon inaugurated WFWP, they proclaimed the coming of a women's era worldwide and they called upon WFWP to take the lead in realizing a peaceful world of one global family, which is God's idea of creation through practicing the motherly heart of true love. Furthermore, they emphasized the importance of facing the tragedy of the division of the Korean Peninsula, which is the biggest obstacle to realizing world peace. After our co-founders visited North Korea in 1991, it was my personal hope and passion that I could find a way to visit North Korea as a WFWP representative. Finally, in February 2001, my chance came. I was one of 10 women representatives from the Korean Women Leaders Association invited by the North Korean Women's Association to visit Pyongyang. Actually, I was born in the North. In 1950, during the Korean War, my family left my hometown of Wonsan in North Korea. So, when I received the invitation, I couldn't sleep at night because of the excitement and fear of stepping on North Korean soil after more than half a century. In Pyongyang, we stayed at the Potonggang Hotel for eight days. We toured the famous sites and held meetings and discussions with the women representatives from North Korea. But every night, we would return to our rooms and break down in tears. The reality of the North Korean people's daily hardships and poor living conditions broke our hearts. Right after returning from Pyongyang, I initiated the 1% Love Share project, especially to help children and women of North Korea. This project was very well received. South Korea's first lady, the late Lee Hee Ho, personally endorsed our project and donated to it. I was interviewed on national radio and the reviews were positive. So our support and donations increased. We also received active support from WFWP members nationwide. We prepared and sent supplies for North Korean children and women two or three times a year either by land or sea. Whenever possible, we found out what supplies they wanted and which organization to send them to, sometimes in cooperation with the Korean Council for Reconciliation and Cooperation or other NGO organizations. We sent things like rice and flour, blankets, warm clothes, and school supplies for children. With our continued efforts to help North Korean women and children without any political agenda, I felt the hearts of North Korean women leaders begin to open up. WFWP held the World Women Leaders Assembly in October 2007 at Mount Kumgang in North Korea. This was the first time for such a large international gathering to be held in North Korea since the division of the peninsula. With the encouragement from Reverend and Dr. Moon, 740 women representatives from 50 nations worldwide 
participated in this World Women Leaders Assembly along with the WFWP, North and South Korean authorities also actively supported this event, since they well understood the goodwill of Reverend and Dr. Moon. Notably, the North Korean authorities sent an official delegation of 10 high-ranking officials. It was the first in history where women leaders representing the two Koreas and women leaders representing other parts of the world joined together to promote world peace and the reunification of North and South Korea. Of course, it was not easy to find the common ground between North and South. Still, in the very last program, we all shared a very inspiring and encouraging moment as we lit our candles and expressed our hope for peace in a candlelight prayer for peace. At the end of the uh, conference, all my hardships and sorrow uh, disappeared. And I was full of hope and joy when the representatives from North Korea said, this event is a historical one we will never forget. Both Korean governments evaluated the Kumgang Women's Conference as very successful and offered to hold more similar events. North Korea especially wanted to hold next uh, event in Pyongyang. Reverend Moon and Dr. Han Moon have been teaching us that the reunification of the Korean Peninsula should happen as part of God's providence not through human plans or actions. And it should be a unification centering on God's will, not human beings' ideas. Dear women leaders, when we practice the motherly love God gave to us, we women are strong. That is why mothers can do great things. And at the very front stands the mother of peace, Dr. Han Moon, practicing this great motherly love for the world. Let us unite centering on our mother of peace, Dr. Han Moon, and take the lead in creating a world of peace. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, that was amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Lang Yam Moon, for your amazing presentation. It was very deeply moving. And I remember uh, the time that you were appointed as uh, the representative for uh, the Reconciliation Council between North and South Korea. That was quite an incredible achievement that you, you, um, you accomplished. Yeah, our, we, you know, we are continue with our efforts towards bringing reunification between the North and South Korea. Especially, I was very moved by how our humanitarian outreach was uh, a very uh, important linchpin that really moved the hearts of the Korean women leaders. Uh, we know that uh, during that time there was a severe famine and many children and families were suffering and through our efforts, worldwide efforts to really support this 1% Love Share project, a humanitarian project to really uh, bring peace and some kind of uh, food security, actually, to the people who are suffering so much. And, and sometimes that is all that is needed. People need food at that time and nothing else. So um, really, it was deeply moving. And our Worldwide Women's Federation have been supporting this 1% Love Share project for many years. And we will continue to support until we get this reunification of the two Koreas. And also, I would also like to testify to the point that uh, these uh, 740 women who went to North Korea, I was honored and had the privilege to be one of those women, actually to be part of that delegation. It was such a, a heartfelt, uh, moving experience to step into a territory that he's, has been blocked for so many years and has been really um, blocked by so many just unnecessary uh, policies. And 
I think that women have an incredible role to play in really bringing reconciliation. I remember when, go, when I was going through the security checks and I could see the, uh, the Korean soldiers, I could feel that they are, uh, their heart and they are also same as you and I, you know, they also have a family. They also want to, you know, have peace between these two nations. And Korea is a very special country and has a very special role, I think, to play in the world uh, platform. And we hope that very soon that this reconciliation can happen between these two Korean nations. Um, yes, the, the experience that I had in North Korea was really uh, deeply etched in my heart. And I was really privileged and uh, honored to be, uh, to have the opportunity to go there. Uh, and also I feel my fellow women uh, who delegation feel the same. We could see that the nature was so pristine and beautiful actually untouched and so crystal clear. So we really hope that uh, real unification can happen in Korea. It is our heart heartfelt uh, desire, even though I am based here in London, but uh, that doesn't matter where one is based. The thing is that we want to really see peace in this world. And also I would like to testify in conclusion to this session, um, I would like to testify the amazing um, vision that our founders have of the Women's Federation, the late Dr. Sam Young Moon and our uh, dear um, um, beloved uh, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon who have been uh, really promoting the importance of reconciliation of this nation Actually, it is really important. Uh, it is a strategic nation in the world, Providence. So we really are grateful that uh, to all our presenters who have really uh, outpoured their hearts to find solutions where we can really uh, come together and to really find solutions. I feel that women have a very important role. Perhaps that has not been tapped enough where women can really contribute to the the. Uh, peace and reconciliation processes. Women have a special role to play, especially with their feminine leadership of compassion and forgiveness, and to go beyond um, uh, the barriers that have stopped this reconciliation from coming forth. I'm so grateful to every single person, especially to our, our um, speakers, uh, distinguished speakers, uh, you are so important in this reconciliation process. I hope that we can unite together, work together for the sake of real re reunification. And also it was very good to hear how the young people are doing surveys and finding out how other young people feel about how reconciliation is a very important aspect. Perhaps they never went through these world wars or, or these uh, difficult situations but actually it, at the end, it is very important that this nation is united. So on that note, I would like to thank everybody for joining us and taking time to spend time to really uh, think about this uh, process of reconciliation. I know, I know that Dr. Hak Jahan Moon, our founder, has been uh, visiting and promoting through her rallies of hope that uh, we have hope in this uh, world that uh, peace can come to all families. And she's always promoting that we are one family under the heavenly parent, the heavenly God. And uh, I think that uh, we have to kind of tap into that. There's not so much difference between us actually. So, um, so that was just my account on what I felt about this whole session. It was deeply moving. And I hope that we can move forward together I'd, I'd like to now <clears throat> finish on this point and thank everybody. And <clears throat> I'd like to pass on uh, the baton to our next uh, speaker who will be uh, Master Debru. She will be um, chairing the entertainment session of our program. So thank you very much for participating. So please stay on for uh, the entertainment and session two, which will be very enlightening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miti. Dear guests and friends, I'm Marcia de Abreu, 
Welcome to this part of today's program. We have prepared a wonderful and moving entertainment for you. First, we will watch a video of North Korean youth performing a typical Austrian melody, Erz Herzog Johann Jodler. You may be asking why Austrian? Well, these North Korean musicians were able to learn and play jazz, Latin, Austrian, and Korean music directed by Mrs. Isabella Kraft, an Austrian teacher of mouth harmonica who was teaching in North Korea. From that encounter, Mrs. Kraft understood that music is a sure way to unite the peoples and their cultures. Back in her country, she initiated an exchange program with the North Korean students and about 15 of them spent 18 months in Austria, visiting museums, going to the theater, to the circus, and playing concerts as well. They could learn about Austrian and Western culture during that period, but also the Austrian people could learn about North Korea through these enthusiastic musicians. And their perception about, about North Korea was changed. In Mrs. Kraft's opinion, music will definitely open a door for reconciliation between the two Koreas, as it arouses the highest emotions in everyone's heart. So please enjoy with them as they play. Let's give them a round of applause. Wasn't that lovely? Our next performance will be a clip with the Little Angels from South Korea. The Little Angels, a children's folk ballet, was established by the Reverend Sam Moon and his wife, Dr. Hak Moon, in 1962 to convey to the people of the world the peace longing spirit of the Korean people and the beautiful culture and art of, of Korea. They have performed all around the world, including an exclusive performance for US President Eisenhower. To date, the Little Angels have traveled over 50 countries, 
have made over 60 tours and have given more than 7,000 7, stage performances in Korea and abroad. We will watch a documentary video about their visit to North Korea in 1998, featuring some of their performances and showing the meaningful and heartfelt reactions by the North Koreans, young and old. So let's watch it. After a cute and friendly greeting, the little angel's songs and dances unfolded in the north, beginning with the flower crown dance. The young boys and girls dance together with comical expressions. At every gesture, at every moment, the northern audience blossomed into smiles. responded with warm applause. The children were enthusiastic and concentrated totally for an excellent performance. traditional dances and songs blend together and flow on. The Korean people of the North could feel anew that all Koreans are one people with roots in a 5,000 year old culture. As the entire company excitedly performed the farm dance, the audience responded with spontaneous applause. The highlight of the Pyongyang performance was the chorus. After singing the song, The Pioneer, as soon as the little angel sang the northern song, We are happy to meet you, our northern brethren's hearts opened wide, and performers and the audience became one. The chorus reached its peak while singing the unification song together. As they sang with tears, all the participants' hearts were longing for the day of unification. While the North and South sang with one heart, the stage and the audience became a sea of tears.
as the nearly two hour moving panorama finished with the end of the choir's song, it seemed the theater would rise up from the thunderous applause. Members of the audience came to the stage and gave bouquets to the little angels, embraced them, and shared joy together. Chairman Young Soon Kim, who saw the performance for the first time, also came to the stage and enthusiastically complimented the children. <laughs> Applause burst out from the audience over and over again. Since the founding of the company, the company has performed thousands of times, but there has never been acclamation like this before. With each child holding a bouquet, the little angels received no less than 10 curtain calls, and they were washed over by waves of emotion. Like a dream. Wasn't that beautiful? Even though we cannot listen to each other, let's give them a round of applause for what it means, uh, that occasion. Thank you. The Lintel Angels will continue to contribute to the development and the dissemination of traditional culture and arts and to fulfill their civilian peacekeeping diplomatic mission. So thank you again. We have come to a close of the entertainment and I sincerely hope you had a beautiful time. The next part of our program this morning is very exciting as we will be witnesses of the release of an amazing project for peace in the demilitarized zone between the two Koreas. To lead the second session, may I invite Mrs. Caroline Henshin, President of the NGO Committee on the Status of Women, UN Geneva. Welcome, Mrs. Henshin. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Marcia. Very moving, uh, very Marcia. moving entertainment. Um, uh, my name is Carolyn Hanschen. I live in Switzerland. I am uh, working, representing our Women's Federation for World Peace at the United Nations and um, responsible for developing projects in Europe and um, very much involved and engaged with the civil society projects and activities and seeing that they can be communicated to governments actually the good work of especially women uh, locally. Um, thank you very much for joining this timely and we believe significant event, especially to the speakers of the opening session who gave really valuable insights and reassurance to us of the will and of steps already being taken actually toward a future uh, uh, inclusion of women and shared prosperity and peace uh, in the world and in Korea. It was so important to see those faces of the talented artist from the DPRK, North Korean culture, um, the youth especially in the entertainment of this previous session. It is known that one of the biggest impediments to peace and the settlement of peace is the depersonalization of quote unquote, the enemy. So even though the, the final, there were some final scenes of that video that was taken of the little angels, which we didn't have time to include, but in those final scenes, it showed the, uh, the young uh, Korean dancers, uh, the young girls from the North and the South saying goodbye to each other. And I'm sure there was not a person who was not moved to tears 
to see that. The thought of the North Korean girls going back and um, you know, separating after these beautiful friendships they had made in this very deep connection that they could make through sharing their talent and that time together. Uh, so this session that we're coming into now is the really the kind of the applied part of our program. It's entitled Projects, Partners, Partners, Partnerships, and Implementation. And as was just mentioned by Marcia, is centered around a project proposal for the creation of a special place for women of North and South Korea to work together toward um, peace and shared prosperity, to build friendships, possibly at the border that currently divides them, the DMZ. Building trust between people from the bottom up, and in this case, people with a common heritage and history should incentivize and reassure political leaders to take steps towards a formalized peace. And that's what we hope for. Those who can see the opening for peace, in this case, civil society, do not want to wait. And we want to do everything in our power to accelerate these processes. The Women's Peace Zones Project was first, prom first promoted by the Women's Federation in the uh, Women's United Nations Research Network in a series of Human Rights Council events between 2017 and 2019, just before COVID hit the world. With the focus of women, reconciliation, humanitarian programs, peace building, and the environment, the events attracted quite some interest from the UN agencies working uh, in the DPRK in North Korea, prominent academics who are studying peace, even members of the UN missions of both Koreas and other curious government institutions. The idea was born from and meant to take the first practical steps towards the establishment of a larger peace zone project, which would include innovative peace-related institutions. Several of our speakers today will elaborate on these ideas. The Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Situation uh, in North Korea, who is based in Geneva, Mr. Thomas Soeya Quintana, was invited and would have liked to join us today. He's currently in South America, uh, but urgent matters uh, prevent him from joining us. But his, uh, in his work, having been confronted on many levels with resistance, even in trying to get into North Korea, he has been from the outset very, very enthusiastic about this project. Twice he sent messages to our UN events and briefings, one of which I'd like to quote here. He said, now is the time to invest all efforts to push for a substantive engagement and meaningful opening, a future forged through the energy and goodwill of the Korean people, which meets their hopes, expectations, and human rights. When I see this women's DMZ project, that it seeks to anticipate the needs of and plans for a future of peace and launches a concrete proposal of establishing in or near the DMZ, a peace building partnership meeting place uh, for women, I feel hopeful about prospects of peace. So he who has really tried hard to help uh, could see the, the great potential in this project. So I'd like to be now to introduce our first uh, speaker, our main keynote speaker of this session. Uh, from whom the other speakers of this session will in some way respond to her propo this proposal. Dr. Anna Grishting is an urban designer, more specifically a designer of border areas, the place where conflicts start and stick. She has designed transformational projects at those hot beds of conflict around the world. She is based in Geneva, as am I, and believe we can, and, and I believe we met because it is the way it works when you are longing for something to happen and looking everywhere for possibilities to make it happen. 
we can say karma or God, but now actually Anna and I are good friends and partners in longing for the realization of this project as a small but very promising concrete step for peace on the Korean Peninsula, a peace working through women. So Dr. Anna Grishting, we are so pleased to welcome you and she will have a PowerPoint and you will find the rest of her very um, inspiring um, bio in the chat box. So Dr. Grishting. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Carolyn, um, for this uh, lovely introduction uh, and also for bringing me on board uh, with this project. It's, it's a great honor to be participating uh, on this project for Women's Peace Zone and also thank you to all uh, the Women's Federation for World Peace and all the partners and speakers. Um, so I will uh, begin to present the project that we are developing uh, with Carolyn. Uh, and uh, the idea is to develop a space for women's peace and environment in the Korean demilitarized zone. So the themes are inclusive peace building, women peace and the environment, memory forgetting and forgiving, nature, culture and the DMZ and the idea of the co-creation of uh, this space. So these are themes also that come from my other work on uh, border, border zones. So women, peace and nature is, I think, a very important and also emerging theme. Um, and I also um, uh, just uh, created this, uh, uh, this representation um, where we have a different uh, sharing what we share knowledge joy inspiration the sacred trust connection and honor things that i think are important when we come together to co-create and it's also co-creating not just with humans but also with all species and of course we're talking about women and we've had some uh, excellent presentations uh, today about the importance of women in peace and uh, this is uh, the Wings of Humanity, a Cherokee prophecy that says the 21st century um, uh, will, will be the one where women will, will once again be, um, uh, be at the forefront or find a balanced relationship uh, with men. And it says that the bird of humanity has two wings, one male and one female. And it's been flying for centuries with only the male wing fully extended. And in the 21st century, the female wing will also fully extend. So I like this, this sort of um, this prophecy, which which we feel is is starting to uh, to sort of to to manifest today. So inclusive peace building means including obviously all communities um, and, you know, from the top down uh, from communities from bottoms up and top down but also all species um, I think we're increasingly uh, learning uh, and this also with the pandemic that we're very interconnected with our systems with our species and our nature and also with our microbiomes and uh, even viruses so the importance of this so um, also, inclusive peace. This is a citation of Ban Ki-moon. It's the idea that all stakeholders in a society should have a role in defining <clears throat> and shaping peace, including women's groups. So uh, I, I won't read this because there's, there's not much time, but it's just this importance as, and I think it's already been mentioned uh, today in many of the speeches. Um, so women, peace and nature is also important. And when I began my PhD uh, uh, in 2004, I actually went to a talk by Wangari Matai because she had just been given the Nobel Peace Prize. And it was the first time that a peace prize had been given to, and related to the environment. So it was a woman, it was peace and the environment. And it was the Green Belt uh, movement that she developed in Kenya with women to restore the ecosystems and also to create livelihoods. Um, so, so it had this double function. And what's really interesting is then how this kind of scaled up and became public policy in Kenya and uh, created an atlas of ecosystems and human well-being. So really having this large impact. 
Um, and of course, this is the work of the Women's Peace Federation, um, women from North and South meeting together. And we've heard uh, the presentations and beautiful performances of this ongoing work um, that's been going on for many years, uh, the wonderful work that the Women's Federation is, is conducting. Um, so it's the relationship to the other and the relationship to the environment. And I also talk about memory, forgetting and forgiving, because my work is also about how do we create sort of landscapes of memory and honor all the victims. And we have to be able to forgive and sometimes uh, have some form of forgetting. But we also have to remember and honor. And Robert Schumann said borders are the scars of history. So this is a map that I made showing all the old, you know, the, the historical walls, Hadrian's Wall, the Iron Curtain, which I worked on, etc. And also the contemporary walls. And we know that eventually when we look at the long view of history, all these walls will eventually fall. But what remains? And they can actually, what I like to say is that can, they can become beautiful scars depending on how we transform and this idea from the deep wound to the beautiful scar. So this is what is behind the work that I'm doing on these border zones. So I usually work on really this large territory uh, landscape, regenerative landscape. This is a project for the Iron Curtain. The idea is to keep the patrol path, which we find in all of these border zones, as a, as a sort of a, a, a path for a cyclist, uh, the idea is to be able to cycle all the way through the European Green Belt. So these are obviously ideas that can be applied elsewhere. I've proposed this in, in Cyprus. And you can see there's also all these endangered species, the idea of keeping this green belt. Um, and there are also landscapes of memory. So this is a monument for the veterans of the Soviet Finnish war. And so they don't, they can be landscape memorials. They don't need to be um, uh, sort of more traditional memorials or de or divisive memorials. Uh, the memorials also need to be inclusive. So this is, uh, I worked on Berlin, my work started in Berlin in 1989 when the wall fell and um, this, this park, Mauer Park in Berlin was actually um, an initiative of the people working on both sides. It was a very dense area in Berlin and there were no green spaces. So this was a bottoms up approach that was then taken on uh, by the authorities and it became a landscape of memory and a beautiful park, very, very vibrant park in Berlin today. This is a project that I also, that has not unfortunately been built yet, but it's called the Garden of Forgiveness in um, Beirut. And I proposed it also in, in, in Cyprus on the right, you can see the Bastion in Cyprus. And uh, it was created with all the communities. I won't go into the, uh, the, the war in Lebanon, it's very complex, but there were obviously many different communities and factions. And this is a very symbolic place in Beirut and has very many layers of histories and also um, uh, histories of all the different faiths and communities. So this was really a co-creation of this garden of forgiveness. So I hope one day it will emerge, but it was also in connected to the green line which separated Beirut during the civil war. So the dancing cranes, we were we had this beautiful dance earlier and also the, 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 the presentation of this cultural project, a music project. So culture is very important as well to bring people together beyond boundaries, beyond language, beyond divisions. And um, and the cranes are very symbolic also in uh, Korea. So um, this is the, the joint security area. So these spaces are just showing sort of the, 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 the physical uh, division of uh, Korea and the military landscape. So here we have a representation. This was a student at the, the Harvard GST, but we see this this military representation. But we also see this other representation, which is actually the ecosystems being regenerated by the fact that there is this demilitarized zone, even if it's highly militarized. But but these this area has actually been able, because there's no development, to regenerate the ecosystem. So the, the idea is how do we build on this positive evolution of nature? Um, there are also sacred sites um, in the DMZ, and one is the famous Gyeom, Gyeomgang Sun Mountain, the Diamond Mountain in Gangwon Pro Province, which we heard about earlier, and also another temple, the Treasure Gate Temple. There are many, but we, we're obviously interested in those that are near the DMZ. So these are sites which uh, all the Koreans would relate to, and also 
Um, the shamanism, for example, this is the mountain god. We were talking about this sacred mountain and also which has been a symbol of peace in in um, in the work that the women have, the, the, the Women's Federation for Peace have had uh, uh, meetings there. So it's it's also a symbol of peace, a becoming. Um, so uh, a Korean shamanism and woman. So it's also interesting to look at this because this is something um, that also connects, obviously, people and nature and is also uh, pre-existing, obviously, the, con the, the conflict. And also the Harvest Festival is something that's still also celebrated in the North and South. So the cranes, I was very blessed to see dancing cranes in the DMZ when I visited with Professor Kui Gon Kim uh, from Seoul National University. We were working together on the DMZ. Um, and that evening I was in, um, in a restaurant and I actually saw this shamanic uh, dance of the cranes. So we can see uh, uh, you know, from from uh, from the the nature and the animals and the people, and it's also a symbol, obviously, in Korea and the region for peace, long and longevity. Um, and also, what's interesting is there are programs um, for the restoration uh, in the DMZ because the cranes are migratory species, and they stop in the DMZ because of of this renaturalization of the area. Um, and so, so they're also coming because of this, you know, this um, uh, slowing down of development because of the DMZ. So, so these projects are trying, uh, working, the Crane Foundation is working on, on these projects with the cranes. And so it's a great opportunity um, also in very symbolic uh, uh, way. I think it, it can be a great foundation also for our project to look at um, these this wildlife species, this symbolism, and also as we have seen the culture and the dancing. So these are just some other, uh, just making reference that women have been very important um, in crossing the, the DMZ through the different initiatives of Peace Women and um, the, the women peace building across the DMC. So there's already many initiatives. And so the idea um, also that's been developed and also with, with the Women's uh, Peace, uh, International Peace Forum and Carolyn is the idea of, you know, how could we also bring together these different women's movements to create uh, this space in the DMZ. So I'll just briefly um, show these dancing cranes. I won't uh, maybe show the whole uh, video, um, but, but I think this coming together of the two cranes, the north and south, the dancing, the culture, I think is is and and obviously the ecology and the environment um, is is, uh, I think, a wonderful symbolism and maybe an inspiration for us to um, to build and create the foundations um, for this um, for this peace zone for the women in the DMZ. Um, so there's for the whole DMZ, there's different conceptual frameworks and we have the flows, obviously, as we saw the flyways of the birds, the backbones, you know, the patrol path that we saw in the Iron Curtain, habitat corridors and then core areas. And of course, this um, this women's peace zone would be one of the core areas in the DMZ. Um, uh, as we see, there's cultural hotspots, memorial hotspots, archaeological hotspots, and then punctual events. And we see that the events that we've seen earlier with the women and maybe future events that we will host will also be punctual events that, that begin to create also this vision. So here I'm just sharing a map of the core areas buffer zone. So this is a mapping of the sort of biodiversity. So this gives us an idea where there are really uh, areas that should be preserved or developed in a specific way. So um, here we're going into also this idea of peace zones as an avenue for stability. And here I want to make reference to um, this is uh, the, the project that was developed already as that Carolina has mentioned. So I'm not going to go too much into into the detail. But th so what we are doing is building on on this this idea that was developed already. Um, with uh, this idea of a fifth UN office in the DMZ, um, which was already um, discussed in 2009 uh, in Geneva. So here there were some sketches already for this idea of a, of a UN a complex in the DMZ, a fifth office. And here I've just brought, uh, you know, I looked at where are the four offices, uh, New York, Geneva, Nairobi, Vienna. So of course there's, a, a, you know, a, a good um, uh, um, uh, motivation to have one also in Asia. 
And uh, my idea is also, we, we saw this great presentation from the youth earlier, and to have a reflection on actually what is what will be the UN in the future, because of course what we're planning is not just for the next five, ten years, but maybe we need to look at 2050, like um, the COP the COP is doing, etc. And what will be the UN in, in the future? Um, so we can, you know, maybe discuss focused on women, focused on the environment, focused on youth, on biocultural diversity, transboundary regions. Will it still just be, you know, nations, because United Nations is based on nations, is this still relevant? New governance systems, sharing economies, regenerative ecologies. Um, so this Women's Peace Garden is a seed to develop the visions of a future fifth UN office, perhaps that's the question, and saying, you know, maybe this idea of women is that this fifth UN office will also be um, more connected with these new paradigms, which are more inclusive and obviously more inclusive with women. Um, so, uh, so w w you know, these are the ideas that were already um, mentioned by Carolyn uh, Hanshin, and I really like these fertile shoots of hope through the, thaw the, the thawing soil. And the idea of the garden is really that it's, it's a landscape approach. So we saw the, the UN offices that are already built. And, and as an urbanist and architect, my work is really saying, well, in the future, we're not probably going to build all these big monumental buildings, but we will really start from the ground up. So it will be a garden that will then develop and um, and then, you know, there will be structures, infrastructures, etc. But then also, you know, maybe there will be much more of a digital aspect, obviously, of it, as we know, in virtual aspect, um, but grounded in the landscape and the garden. So um, eco diplomacy is is uh, something that I'm working on. And the E is, as I meant, also related to the, the digital um, and the co-diplomacy is this co-creation. So I think this, you know, this is a concept in which our work can also really um, be integrated. Um, so it's an act, an inclusive act of healing, co-creating and, re and then reconciliation. The act of creating these spaces can also bring people together and create reconciliation in divided societies and across boundaries. So we've already seen this idea of the, the, be the idea of creating a beautiful scar. So um, UNESCO talks about biocultural diversity. So I think that's also an important concept because we mustn't talk just about biodiversity. We must also talk about the communities. Um, and so I won't go into details about this, but I think it's a very important concept that we should integrate the socio-ecological systems that we would uh, integrate and that it's a multi-stakeholder approach as well. Um, a peace synergy multi-stakeholder with the, you know, I, I, we know about the different tracks of um, diplomacy. Obviously, we are probably, we're here in the grassroots and community, but also at the, the level of NGOs and the UN. And also the multi-scaler, so we're looking at the scale of a, of a peace centre, but we're also looking at the whole DMZ and the region. This is just an example from Cyprus, where you see the different scales from the different parcels of the, of the historic city to the region between Greece and Turkey. Um, here's a comparison with Cyprus and uh, the Korean DMZ. So this is work that I developed in my PhD. And here I'm just showing some of the visions that you know I started to develop for the Cyprus buffer zone. So art and music as a bridge, and we saw in the interstice between the two sessions, uh, the importance of this. So the importance of developing also um, the visions and bringing people together through the culture. These are projects that have already been developed um, in Korea. Um, the Thousand Dreams, um, these shoulders actually creating this huge wall of new visions. Um, and, um, and, and also obviously um, looking at uh, how we build on these, uh, these heritage sites uh, and bringing in uh, UNESCO um, for this work. So, so one of the areas we've thought about is the Gangwon province because it's actually the province that's the most, most equally divided. And also because the Pyeongchang Forum, um, I presented last year um, my work there and um, it's, uh, well, 2019. Um, it, it's, uh, uh, so they have, they have this uh, legacy of peace related to the Olympics. And the Olympics was also where there was a team from North and South uh, that, that, that performed at the Olympics. So the idea is to find a space 
uh, uh, and to launch this in the Gangwon presence. So these are just the final reflections to sum up a little bit. Um, so it's development of nature-based solutions and regenerative systems and structures that are emerging today and have been accelerated by the pandemic. We are also becoming increasingly aware of our intrinsic and interdependent relationship with nature, with all species, with microbiomes. Importance of protecting nature communities to combat climate change and pandemic. So, so this project and the large say will also be participating in this. So the vision for the DMZ, the future vision, what will be the fifth UN in the future from conflict to co-creation and the Women's Peace Zone co-created with communities in North and South, the local and international NGOs located possibly in the Gangwon province. But of course, this is all of this is open up to discussion with all of you today and obviously in the future with all the, the partners is where is, is the ideal. Uh, but one of the ideas is to um, look at the space in Gangwon and then to, to have a workshop and present this at the Pyeongchang uh, Peace Forum. So this is a beautiful poem by Michel Boutour. Thus the overcome frontier becomes a vibrating membrane that which produces the sound as well that, as that which receives it. It becomes the place where two territories press together lovingly, the contact point of their two skins. The redoubled frontier freed comes to life as a couple who dance, drawing their shadow and their flame on the walls of the planet Earth and conquering space in their embraces. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for this opportunity today to present and for inviting me also to co-create uh, this project uh, with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. You, um, I've heard you speak a few times about this and each time you invest more and more of your heart and your talent and your experience in really thinking this out for us because we have been thinking about, you know, Women's Federation, we've been thinking about what we can do in this place, but we could not picture what it would look like actually, or, and I think this still needs to be further developed, but even in giving it this concept of garden is already, you know, is already bringing in new, many new thoughts. Um, also, I it was for me, especially exciting to, to hear you uh, your projections about uh, a future United Nations. You know, we, we, I hope many are thinking about these things because it's very exciting to think about that, that of course it is developing and evolving and maybe a space is being created just for what we're planning, you know, at this, at this place at the DMZ. So thank you so much. We look forward to continuing our work together with you and um, really brilliant presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. So our next, now we will go into um, uh, a series of, we're calling them respondents. Uh, our first respondent, a respondent to this idea and in general, the ideas, you know, related to especially women's contribution to this kind of peace building and peace work. Our first speaker, actually, I have to say, uh, is very brave. Her name is Miss Kiara Carafa, and she only learned yesterday that she <laughs> would be able to, that she would have this opportunity to, to speak. And uh, maybe for the first time, I think she just now heard about this project. So uh, we are so grateful, Miss Carafa. Uh, she is a communications expert, a journalist. She collaborates with uh, Euro Communications which is a think tank about Europe that has the patronage of uh, Italian representatives of the European Commission and European Parliament. <clears throat> she is also very engaged in the social sector and she promotes initiatives to spread awareness of individual and collective rights. Again, thank you so much. This is Chiara Carafa, you have the floor. Thank you very much and I thank you, you for inviting me here at this uh, fundamental annual meeting where I will intervene giving voice to Ero Comunicazione too. Yes, I knew just yesterday night that I would uh, participate in this uh, uh, important meeting and I, I took some notes while you were speaking. So I have listened with profound attention to your presentations uh, meditating about what we can do 
to help to reach a real reconciliation uh, between North and South Korea. Uh, I guess that this must be more than just a desire. It must be something that we, uh, well, realize together. And I guess that to achieve a truly inclusive and concrete peace building process, we can work at different levels. One of these is, without any doubt, communication, effective communication, capable of bringing people, minds and hearts together. The word heart, hearts, has been used different times this morning. And I think that together with mind and talent um, are a very good word to uh, spread, um, well, our best uh, and incredible um, dreams about a future that starts today. So a communication that knows how to simplify the language to make the most important and incisive contents available, accessible to a wider number of people around the world, but also able to speak to an institutional audience to ask for actions that contribute to changing the life of an important number of our population. Euro Comunicazione focuses a large part of its attention, attention really on words, fair, non-offensive, non-discriminatory, clear, and above all, verified and true. The DMZ project has captured my attention. It represents an extraordinary occasion to act a change. While listening to its presentation, I felt engaged in this community, and I thank you to be part of this community. I feel part of this community too. Scars and boundaries sometimes are kind of milestones that bring to a new start. And we do hope that DMZ, DMZ is going to be a place that speaks peace as a native speaker, like a mother tongue, brand new language. This transcending the diversity of languages that two Koreas now speak, not just within their own states. Eurocomunicazione is on your side, along with you, to disseminate together adequate information on pacification process that you, we, women, put into practice every single day. We are crucial, and we know it. This effort is being carried out silently in the different contexts in which we operate. In our various family and social roles, such as that education that let equal opportunities to all. To continue our synergic action is also essential to train communication professionals to use online digital platforms and have press organs that broadcast live. Live. Live is a very important and crucial word. Only in this way, in fact, will the news arrive without filters and manipulations. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Of course, this is such a critical ele element in the success of any venture or initiative is uh, communication. And uh, that you mentioned uh, not only communication like person to person or within communities, but actually being able to really influence uh, institutions and of course governments is where we are also aiming our uh, you know our words and our, our our actions towards we need to really engage of course the governments of the North and South Korea and the international community if it involves the United Nations and we appreciate so much that you actually in some ways maybe offer to help us spread this word so thank you so much uh, Miss Carafa, thank you. Thank you again. Um, our next speaker is Professor Kyung Do Su. He, yeah, welcome, Professor Su. Um, he is a pro currently a professor at Kumo National Institute of Technology. He is a former member of the Advisory Committee for Democratic Peace and Unification, 
uh, the Ministry of Public Administration and Security. Uh, he is a lecturer and uh, government innovations instructor. So these are all important elements also to the uh, share, passing the, the information also about this project. He has also received awards uh, from the uh, Ministry of Justice and from the province, the Gyeongbuk Province Police Agency. So a very renowned person whom we are very looking forward to hear him speak about International Cooperation Plan for the DMZ World Peace Park. So you have been thinking about this already very much. Thank you, Professor Su, you have the floor. Yeah, 반갑습니다. 오늘 발표를 맡게 된 어, 서경도 교수입니다. 오늘 DMZ. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, today is a speaker, Sojong-do. Uh, this is Sojong-do. I'd like to introduce my table of contents. Uh, first is the significance of the role of NGO, a third sector in the designation of the DMZ International Peace Park. The second is the DMZ Culture and Peace Establishment Plan. Third is successful cases of solidarity between NGOs since this all being conflict between countries. And first, uh, establishment of the International Convention Center in the DMZ and the Attraction International Organization. The first, uh, the significance of the law of NGOs and the sector, uh, and sector the sector, the NGOs International Peace Park. I'd like to introduce this. In relation to the designation of the DMZ International Peace Park, NGOs are expected to play in a significant role in human rights and property environment and other issues in preparation for the reunification of North and South Korea. Searching from test experience, and just have been actively working to resolve not only general social issues related to politics, military, economy, and diploma, but also practical national or ethical issues such as human rights, poverty, and environment, and cooperative development, etc. Uh, many NGOs have accumulated a lot of know how in the process, and they play a significant role in many ways. First, ex expand support and cooperation of uh, they expand the support and the cooperate with the international community. And second, they serve NGO serve as a buffer in the relationship between North and South Korea. Third, the NGO form a sense of national community. And and um, fourth, the contribute to, to alleviate, alleviating humanitarian crisis due to economic development cooperation. People to contrib um, NGO contribute to the development issue and sexes contribute to the military issues. In this way, NGOs can influence the policy making in neighboring countries and make it possible to create internal uh, public plan opinions. And how do we create the MGS culture and peace establishment plan? I think it is very closely related to uh, with the cultural and the artistic change in music, cultural heritage, film, ecological uh, science, education, etc. If uh, our establishment of DMZ International Peace Park will make various cultural and artistic uh, changes possible, and it can be used as a place to uh, create a new culture, inviting artists from around the globe. People from North and South Korea and around the world will receive a variety of inspirations from the new cultural creations from this site. Therefore, it is a good idea to turn DMG into an international peace park that can serve as a place of peace and 
new life and uh, promote its registration of uh, UNESCO heritage. And next is a successful case of solitary solidarity between NGOs. For example, the University of Maryland International Development and Complete Media Center, the CART. Through the recreation and the military support group and the International Emergency Response Center, the conciliation and the Mediterranean support group and the International Emergency Regional Team may be cited. For example, it includes solidarity between NGOs and the internal organizations, solidarity between international NGOs and in local NGOs and solidarity between international NGOs and the government issues that NGO solidarity transcend national boundaries as it played an important role in resolving conflict between countries. In addition, a clear purpose for resolving these problems and the sense of duty and the patience of the activities who carry them out must be strong. The outstanding personal ability of the representatives is a very important non-diplomatic factor in resolving conflict between countries. And the most important factor in successful international MGOS activities is the ability to make fair and human policy decisions and establishment based on the universal values of man-made. In addition to justification of establishing the NGOs International Solidarity Headquarters and the Convention Center in the DMZ country continuously attempt should be made to obtain explicit and or implicit consent from North Korea. It is important that there is a cause and the interest for North Korea to comply with the demands of international solidarity of NGOs and that North and South Korea from a virtual, virtual assistant system and provide an active support. The policy and the implement of the government of the Republic of Korea to overcome the confrontation with North Korea and to accelerate unification is not in vain. Later, it represents one aspect of the address uh, process toward the unification, it would be necessary to suggest the uh, present and the future direction toward the unification and set up a specific and realized roadmap. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Su. I'm so sorry the time is so short. <laughs> it's yeah. You had so many, many important points and I think myself yeah. and I think all of us realize that yeah. we need to communicate more you know, what is hap what you are thinking in doing in Korea, not only related to this, this particular project, mm -hmm. Peace Park project, but in other ways, we need to really understand what each other is working on because it's very, very, um, I think it's very encouraging and empowering for us to realize how much you have been thinking about this and developing ideas related to this. So we hope we can support we can be some peace in this project that you are uh, you are speaking about. Thank you so much, Professor Su. Um, our next speaker. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Beatrice Bischoff. Uh, she is a TV journalist and board member of the Foreign Affairs Association in Germany. Um, her focus is international policy, interdisciplinary in innovations and exchange, uh, dis digitalization and sustainability. So we have a very multidisciplinary uh, speakers today, which is of course, I think the kind that are attracted to us and we to them. Uh, her focus is political science, constitutional law and literature sciences. And she, I think, will today propose a special project um, or a framework for a project, perhaps for our future 
peace zone for women. So Dr. Bischoff, very happy to welcome you. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, for the Women Association for World Peace. For thank you very much for Carolyn to invite me. And um, I have to say yes, it was an interesting project you uh, presented to me. Therefore, I have s special ideas about it. Our Foreign Affairs Association is international because it was since 1948 focusing on international understanding. And my special focus in is interdisciplinary, means on political science, economy, te te technology, and society. Therefore, I have this combination. And now there's another aspect coming uh, because of your topic to me, inclusive peacemaking and intersectoral coordination. So it's international and interdisciplinary a mixture, and it fits to my system of pets. And there I saw, okay, also in your first uh, contribution of, um, of Mrs. Dr. 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 Gingrich, Woman, Peace and Nature. And in my mind came a project I heard some years ago. It was the, uh, uh, the Argandor Initiative of the Arganari in Morocco. There are people of the women uh, um, of the women society of the women corporate uh, corporation are collected to produce the old cultural argan oil, and they do it uh, with uh, as, as a social entrepreneurship um, concept uh, mixed with culture and for women and with women, and they sell it as an economic purpose also. So we have we could trans transport this idea also to Korea. So we can, um, I, in my mind, I thought, why not establish something like a hub or something like a company um, to produce something what's special to Korea, like ginseng or gim, and produce it maybe a combination with the Korea of today with technology. Why not use vertical farming technology or technology out of the sustainable integrated farming to produce a product especially uh, of cultural value of Korea with the hands or with the thoughts of women and with the cooperation of women. So we have a component um, that put together all that is of value for us and maybe also for this Peace Zone project you are um, intending. Um, and this has also a, an economic backing that's never bad uh, to earn money for a woman. Uh, therefore, I thought it could be a quite a good project and um, this combination out of, of, of culture, women, peace, and uh, earning a bit of money could never be bad. And I was asking my colleagues from the vertical farming uh, corporations, and they said, yes, it's theoretically it's possible to produce um, ginseng as a vertical farming project. Uh, it's easier to produce gim as a vertical farming project, but we are in Korea. Korea is a high-tech nation. We could find something um, how to produce this product with the help of the women and for the women and uh, together for the, from the North and the South Korean Women Associations. Wouldn't this be a nice project for you? <laughs> this is my suggestion today. I hope not to ex Ex uh, to, ex uh, to, to prolong your uh, topic for too long uh, of time, and I'm I'm interested for your for your answers. Karen, Thank do you. I still have time, or am I too short or too long, or what do you think? No, no, I think it's it's great, and you will have also a question coming to you a little bit later, so you can also elaborate a little bit more. But thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Beatrice for coming and for um, for sharing this idea that, of course, small business entrepreneurship, if every project needs to have some kind of financial uh, support. And uh, we, you know, we look forward to more innovative ideas from you. We see with each kind of person and partner coming into this project, we have a, a broader uh horizon actually you know and about broader support so please i we hope you will stay with us as we continue to develop this project thank you again so much dr bischoff huh? <laughs> thank you Kevin. Thank you. so thank you and again our next speaker um uh, we have miss isabella Krop. she is vice president of the korean cultural center in vienna and i think you've met her part of her work 
in the entertainment section of our, of our conference today. She is an Austrian harmonicist and harmonica teacher who has visited North Korea four times with the purpose of teaching harmonica since 2011. She has had 120 students. And as uh, was mentioned by, our, by Marcia in the former session, uh, they, they, it's not just Austrian folk music, but jazz, Latin, and even traditional North Korean songs uh, that they are learning and playing together. Uh, so we are very happy, uh, Mrs. Kropp, to hear your contribution to this, uh, this idea with already your experience of working with the culture that in fact we are having the hardest time to engage with. So thank you again, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, well, the old Korean culture is very important in North Korea. Um, there is music, dance, taekwondo, painting, stitching, pottery, food. There are also lots of old stories and songs. And you can see status everywhere in Pyongyang and the country that show the old Korea. Um, you have these wonderful temples here that you have in the country. Um, we had a lot of Korean traditional songs in our program when I worked there. Also, there are songs that speak of unification um, of one country and one nation, or new songs. There is a sadness in these songs and a deep wish to be one again. Just this week, I talked to somebody from the North Korean embassy here in Vienna and they told me that everybody in North Korea is longing for peace and harmony. This is also a picture from the theater where I was working. You see a lot of women also there in the ensemble. Um, the best way to start uh, a movement is the common culture. When we look at the art, the culture, the music, uh, then we notice that North and South Korea has a common story and a way to understand each other despite the long years of separation. Not only would it be interesting for both Koreans, but also for the rest of the world that has a very limited opinion on North Korea. When my North Korean students were in Austria, I had the feeling that this was not only about music. It was about showing the world that there are great, talented people in North Korea. Reunification can only take place when we see North Koreans as sensitive and nice people, people with dreams and hopes like everyone else. Also the journalists should treat these people in the right way. It does not help to have bad and negative news all day long. There are good things like culture and art and they are important and can help to understand each other without words. Art is a way to touch the heart of everybody. Maybe you look at one picture or hear one song and you suddenly understand about Korea. You get a feeling what is important to the artist or the composer or the singer. You can feel a personal emotion with art, even if you don't understand the language. But you get another feeling for a culture or people if you see their culture. There might be Koreans who are not longing for reunification, but I think if they see the things they have in common, their perception might change. I took about 4,500 photos in North Korea and showed them to a large audience. I had exhibitions and presentations, and I always had the feeling that everybody who saw my presentation 
had a different feeling about North Korea after seeing all these pictures. An anonymous, anonymous closed country suddenly becomes something that we can connect with. We can see temples, beautiful landscape, and people who have an everyday life there. Children who go to school or sit around in the park, or grown-ups who are, who are working, singing karaoke or play Korean jazz. Um, North Korea is full of everyday life and I could have spent hours and hours uh, to watch all the scenes in the city or in the country. However, when we realize that there are friendly looking, that uh, there are friendly looking faces in North Korea, faces that belong to very nice and special people, then we can have an open dialogue with North and South and can talk about future projects together. I just want to encourage everybody to have an open heart for North Korean people and their answer will be very kind and very open too. The North Korean embassy is very interested in every project that has the goal of the reunification and we should use all our connections and creativity to talk to them and make our projects become reality. And there is a last picture that I want to show you. It's one of the greatest um, sites in, in North Korea. Um, it's the women of the women of reunification. So you have a North and South Korean woman, woman who reunite. So the North Koreans already know that peace and re reunification is starting with the women's movement. And this is, this is very important, I think, for us to work with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isabella. Uh, really, you brought in so many um, important and actually convincing reasons why uh, we are really moving in the right direction. Huh? And, um, you know, working through communication, common culture, uh, just the fact of, you know, creating experiences where a wider and wider audience can understand this, you know, the hearts and the minds of the Korean people, the North Korea, the people of the North that are not different than our own, you know, that have the same kind of dreams and longing and hopes. And uh, really, we, you, you've given us quite much uh, hope and inspiration for this. And, um, and I think just adding to that, that, of course, the approach is through something like music, teaching music to their children. Also, I know in terms of the, the uh, special rapporteur on disabilities actually was able to enter North Korea, the only special rapporteur. And why? Because these are very non-threatening. I mean, more than non-threatening kind of efforts, but actually efforts with obvious goal to really help, you know, where human rights is a little bit more, <laughs> you know, you have to be a little bit more careful. But thank you so much for your insights. I hope your photo reportage is shared the world over because I think it can be very, very valuable actually in changing minds and hearts to the Korean peoples. So thank you again. Um, um, our final speaker today is uh, someone I know very well. Uh, actually, my husband. And um, normally, we aren't necessarily promoting each other for, for our, we're, we're both doing many different things that overlap sometimes. But he has been a great help in when someone is not able to show up. Like <laughs> this time, we had the special rapporteur who, because of his urgent work, could not attend. And Late last night, I asked very kindly my husband if he would be willing to come in and to say a few more words about an 
a, a, an aspect that has already been actually touched upon today, but which he has spoken about several times at the United Nations in Geneva. So thank you very much, Mr. Heiner Hanshin. He is president, he is the director of the UN offices for the Universal Peace Federation uh, in Geneva at the UN. And he is also uh, president of Family Federation for World Peace and Unification in Korea. Mr. Heiner Hanshin, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, hello, everyone. 안녕하십니까? 반갑습니다. For that, for those who understand Korean, that's is Korean language and just says hello and welcome. Nice to see you all. Um, thank you for giving me an opportunity to share a few thoughts and ideas, just a few small points about this uh, very intriguing topic that you chose about co-creating spaces for peace and reconciliation on the Korean Peninsula. As, as the uh, keynote speaker of this session, Dr. Richting uh, said, this has been a project that uh, our both organizations, the Women's Federation for World Peace, but also the Universal Peace Federation as a partner, uh, we have been working on uh, from uh, over quite a few years already and have so had some ideas. Um, I will not go much into detail, but I will have a few, maybe a little bit provocative ideas and points that I would make. Can I have the next slide, please? So that start with provocative uh, ideas. Um, I mean, uh, here we see, I chose this slide not because uh, particularly I wanna show the, the, the great leaders, but I want to just say basically, despite the odds of sometimes male uh, leadership, there is, when there is an idea whose time has come, you cannot help it. It just will happen. And uh, I want to quote here the, the famous uh, Dr. Klaus J. Duisberg, chief negotiator of Germany, for, for the reunification of both Germanys, where he said in the early 1989, nobody with a common sense thought of the remote possibility of a German reunification, that it would happen by October of the same year. In the beginning of the year, nobody believed in it. So can we have the next slide, please? Yeah, as Dr. Richting mentioned, we have, um, four UN offices and the UN is heavily centered on the West, obviously. And uh, this is probably a remnant of the post-World War situation. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, as we know, the, uh, the uh, UN could actually, as representative of the international community, be very helpful uh, in fostering a, a, a re a de escalation or the re reconciliation, reunification on the Korean Peninsula. But the only thing is the focus is not there. And uh, I think uh, it is our role of the uh, international community of the civil society and of NGOs to remind governments of the focus where we think focus should be. Also for the UN, I think such a slide here shows clearly uh, the, the, the real situation. Can you have the next slide, please? So there is a need for input. Next, please. Um, actually, as the previous speaker uh, mentioned, uh, it's important, of course, that we, as NGOs, we point out the human aspect of, of uh, the, the, the situation in Korea. And I think arts and culture and all these elements are very crucial. But by the same token, we can say the U United Nations as an organization and we as NGOs, we have to keep insisting. And uh, uh, we did this by uh, basically building on the founders uh, initiative in the year 2000, as also Dr. Richting uh, uh, mentioned, 
to the creation of the emphasis on creation of peace zones in trouble spots like, for instance, on the Korean Peninsula. So we built very much on this idea. And in 2009, we organized a, actually it was civil society organizing in partnership with uh, UNIDEA, which is a UN agency, United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research. We organized a conference together with also uh, um, governments of the Philippines and of uh, Indonesia. And uh, I have to say that because he was very instrumental, Dr. Juyun Park, who actually mentioned for the first time this idea of a fifth UN office in that during that conference. So next slide, please. So after that, in 2014, we had this two day program, which was for the first time actually as I remember, co-sponsored with uh, the Korean government, uh, the province of Gyeonggi-do, the governor's office was supportive of this event, and also Paju City, uh, city mayor was represented, and we could uh, present a very rich two-day panel with uh, many, many speakers, including even former head of the, um, of the Council of Europe, Dr. Schwimmer, and so forth and so forth. Many people from the international arena uh, who, could, uh, who supported this idea of a, a fifth UN office uh, in the Korean Peninsula. And uh, I think this is, was really encouraging. Next slide, please. We have after, we have basically done several um, repeated uh, events also at the UN side events during the Human Rights Council in 2018, 2019, and uh, presented even some little bit, some, some maps and some proposals how this could look. I don't want to go into the Details, Dr. Richting already said a lot of things. Can we have the next slide? And maybe, yeah, also next one. Um, so we finally um, thought it would be important for, for women as peacemakers to uh, really create this scenario uh, of an international UN city. Even this is a little bit big, thinking, but anyway, I think we need to be visionaries in this sense and uh, to create an international UN cities with uh, offices, also various agencies. We had the idea there uh, and disarmament, but also other uh, uh, offices where and especially, of course, like in the framework of this topic today, bringing in women's leadership in uh, this area and showing the, the power of reconciliatory efforts through women. I, I can say that I'm a father of five daughters and two granddaughters, four granddaughters, sorry. I, I can see the qualities of women in terms of uh, getting together uh, and, and creating a, a peace, peace and harmony amongst each other. So thank you very much, Madam Chair. I hope I didn't overdo too much time-wise. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, very much for coming in and just further advancing our, um, you know, our realization that there are many, many paths coming to this point where this, the idea for this project, and I mean, not just the smaller project, but the larger project really can uh, come into fruition at this time. Thank you again. I invite you for dinner tonight. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, thank you everyone, all of our speakers, each and every one has added something very important to this, um, to this uh, conversation. And um, we look forward also to being able to, to really share that in the form of the report and the recording, which we can send around widely also to the United Nations, various places at the United Nations. We have a little bit of time now, uh, and we have been receiving questions for each of you. Um, 
I will thank you, Bridget uh, Wada from France, for helping me to, to organize the questions. Uh, maybe going in the same order as the speakers spoke, I will, uh, we will choose one uh, question for each speaker. Maybe not too long, if you can just in a minute or, or so uh, answer a minute to two, uh, then we will have enough time for everyone. So two are Dr. Anne Gishting. Um, this comes from Mrs. Memong. Uh, why have you chosen, especially this part of the world, in focusing this uh, for the, on this project? Uh, so, is, does she mean that the Korean demilitarized zone or Korea? Um, I think not... I think so. Yes. Yes. That's, yeah. Okay, well, um, I started my work in Berlin. I was in Berlin when the wall fell. And um, then I started, uh, when I continued my research, looking at other divided cities. And then I extended it to look at the whole territories and the buffer zones. And I started to become more in interested in ecology and going beyond the urban field. Also, what I learned from Berlin is that you have to have a solution before there's a reunification. Otherwise, this space or this beautiful scar is very quickly erased by the forces of real estate, which are usually much stronger than any, any forces of ecology and conservation and memory. Um, so, of course, when I started to work on Cyprus on the buffer zone, which was the subject of my PhD, I looked at other uh, cases and then I started to work on the Korean demilitarized zone. And then I started to be invited uh, to Korea. And that's how I met many people working on the Korean demilitarized zone. And I became involved. And um, and it's uh, it's obviously uh, the, the connections then with uh, with other people like Carolyn and the world, uh, the Women's World Peace Movement, then these synergies that create um, then these new ways of moving forward with these ideas. Um, I'm not sure if that answered the question. But mm -hmm. I, think so. <laughs> I think very good. Thank you. Um, our next um, qu the question will be directed to uh, Ms. Chiara Carafa and the role of the media. Your question is, as a journalist in communication, how do you think you could help to bring forward this project at the DMZ? Oh, well, what a great um, question. I think that we can, uh, well, spread the word. We have some kind of power as journalists and communicators. And so we can really, uh, do and put our effort in spreading the word and using, as I said before, um, the right words. Because communication is uh, done in uh, two directions. So we speak, but we must consider that people uh, should be able to understand what we, what we say and uh, the, um, well, um, the, the contents we want to share. And so I think that we are going to be beside you and uh, we want to be beside you with our comunicazione. Um, and uh, we will try to, well, study a little bit more with uh, more time. Um, uh, for me, you, 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 you said it at the beginning of today, that I, I have uh, been invited uh, yesterday night. And yes. so I will study uh, all, all the contents of today. And then I will uh, maybe stay in touch with uh, uh, President Nistri to uh, try to share uh, some, uh, some contents. And uh, well, we could uh, even uh, start a new project together. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next uh, question will go to Professor Su, and that question is, the work of NGOs and civil society are very important in establishing an international convention center in the DMZ, as you said, but government in both countries have to, of course, agree on these programs. How can we reach them and convince them to agree? I think the role of the NGO is very important. And I think we have to uh, comply to the space to uh, cultural uh, part. 
아, 네. 뭐요? 잠시만요. 네. 아, we have to think at we have to emphasize the MDOs role, and then we have to uh, say uh, we will make the cultural park. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Su. And our next question will go to uh, Dr. Beatrice Bischoff. And actually, maybe as she hopes, because maybe she would have had more to say, your question actually was, could you just further elaborate on this idea of some of coming in with uh, of some kind of financial entrepreneurship idea uh, that could really benefit uh, maybe both nations, especially North Korean women? You you ask me. Um, I'm asking. How, I mean, yeah, yeah how we could we could uh, arrange uh, the, the 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 financial backing. Uh, yeah. Well, um, I think it is a it's a idea that still it, it was working in Morocco. Okay, it is uh, established it with a website. They sell the products worldwide, and it's uh, good. The the products are very good. So I think that you can find some social entrepreneurs, and I have also in my in my circles, uh, people who are busy with uh, social entrepreneurship and fundraising. And uh, it could be that we could find some people interested in such a, a project. Because um, nowadays you have uh, also with the SDGs from the European Union and the, and the whole, um, and the whole um, new rules that are um, on the way. Um, we have a lot of um, rule backing and a lot of interests that we do these things. We have a responsible inter entrepreneurship. Therefore, I think this would be a good purpose to, to elaborate this. Mm. To bring together northern and southern women to produce a product they are proud of. That is national, that is cultural, that is cultural, not national, sorry that is cultural and has an impact to them and could pre present uh, the cultural value outside. Uh, so mm. it's comparable mm. to this, to this Arganeri project, what's uh, even, um, it, what is even, uh, um, even uh, sub subjected by the UNESCO because mm. they, pr uh, they protect the woods. And um, the, um, it is, it's, it, I think it is a very good valuable product to sell. I think, mm. yes, I think that this could be for social entrepreneurship and uh, responsible entrepreneurship, a good idea. Good. I think we can also put you in contact with some women, even some of our Women's Federation chapters in South Korea, who might have ideas actually already on this point of and even ways of setting something up. We've done some similar things in the Middle East with the women in Palestine and their special embroidery work that we helped to put on beautiful leather sacks that could be sold and then the money sent back to Palestine, into Palestine. And uh, so, yeah, we will definitely follow up on that with you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Thank you B. very much, Kevin. Yeah. And then next we have Mrs. Isabella Krupp. Um, to say that Western, the Western world to, should change, could and should change their view toward the people of North Korea and look more deeply into the human aspect. How do you think this could bring unification? Well, the point is, um, I have seen tourists in, in North Korea and they have a very bad attitude. Um, they wanna make fun of, of North Koreans. They wanna make, see communism. They wanna, um, mm. it's, it's not a way to treat people and that's why we often think that north koreans are, are closing that north koreans are not open with us because they had very very bad experience with with that and with journalists also soon i i had also very bad experience with journalists they wrote many things about me also and about my group that were absolutely not true and they never talked to us i had a journalist in, in germany who wrote two pages interview that never happened with me. So I have seen very, very uh, bad things there that are not helping uh, for reunification. It's, it's just helping to spread very bad feelings about North Korea and very bad feelings about North Korean people. And it, it can only happen 
to re you, the reunification can only happen if we feel that we have something in common with these people, if we feel that there are really people with real feelings, with, with ideas, with uh, culture, whatever. So uh, if we look down on North Koreans, and I, I have to say that the media is totally looking down on North Koreans. I, I have experienced that myself. If we look down on North Koreans, they, then nothing can change. No peace, no reunification, and they will not get in touch with us because they have a really bad feeling that we have really something bad in mind again with them. So we have to see the good things about these people and, and the common the common things that we have and the culture. And, and um, then we find out that we have a good platform to communicate and to have something in common. And that's why it's so important. Um, and I experienced that really myself with the group that was here. It's so important to give them a chance uh, to, to, and to see them as, as um, equal. That's, that's all I'm, I'm asking for. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, so important. And I think you have one, if not several, who, of course, can help us with that on, on the call right now, Ms. Carafa. Uh, who I'm sure her form of journalism is not like what you described, so she can help us uh, to okay. create that better image. Huh? Uh, and our final question today will go to Mr. Heiner Hanshin. And the question is, um, can you just add or make a little, elaborate a little bit more about how you think the international community, that is not those in Korea, how the international community can really support this project and, uh, you know, in, in engaging the Koreans eventually or the United Nations. But what is the role of those across the seas, you know, in Europe or? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think, uh, first of all, the role of uh, civil society is definitely um, in this particular case is, is to keep reminding and keep pushing and keep repeating and keep making the point uh, in, in international organizations like the UN. There is a big potential there when we make the case for uh, a fifth UN office uh, or just simply let's start before for a de-escalation on the Korean Peninsula or for a uh, potential reconciliation or for just a rapprochement, those are steps that need to be taken. We, we, I think we should um, take this role as NGOs and as civil society to make, uh, to keep repeating these points and to make governments aware that this issue is, is urgent and is, is important to address. I think that's uh, one of the first points I wanted to say. The international community, as we have seen in the um, in the six party talks, has a lot of potential and possibilities. But again, if it's a, just simply uh, national self interests and politics within uh, superpowers, that's also not um, really conducive. So we we need to understand that governments are usually difficult to change, except for the moment when really um, from all over the world, people emphasize that uh, this, this issue should be addressed. And I think uh, the, the, in a smaller frame, I would advise more, maybe start in a smaller frame, uh, but not to leave the big picture, uh, uh, not to forget about the big, big vision of uh, like what I mentioned, the UN city or something like that, that could be really fantastic and uh, could bring uh, so much benefit. And even there have been studies where we could even find out that even resources for building uh, are there in this region. So there's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of wealth actually there also even for building. But anyway, that's just one one aspect of it. So <laughs> sorry. There was, there was also actually a question that just now came in. I can't really give you time to answer, but maybe to mention that because you uh, have been heard to talk about rapprochement instead of 
maybe reunification or other terms that are being used. And maybe if in uh, 30 seconds, could you say why rapprochement is a good word in this situation? Well, well, it has been it has been mentioned in different ways, like uh, also by the by by the previous speaker, uh, Ms. Kraft, that uh, if we dehumanize, dehumanize, uh, it's like uh, it's it's a very it's not conducive to any kind of uh, uh, working together. Now, the, and the other the other aspect when when we say rapprochement it somehow respects the position of the other side. It respects the, the human being on the other side. And I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't forget that. Human beings are just human beings. And uh, rapprochement, nobody wants a takeover. I, no, no, North Koreans don't want to be taken over by the South. And mm -hmm. vice versa are the same. So we need to really carefully um, seek each other's uh, common interests and and togetherness and i think women women's leadership is very crucial in this in this time i think more sensitive and more uh, pragmatic and more encompassing things thank you thank you very much um, so we are at the end of our conference which i feel has been really a uh, and really an amazing experience, actually. We've been together for three hours. Uh, it's impossible really to go back and to, uh, we have still still a few minutes, huh? To go back and, you know, point out all the, 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 the great points and convincing um, points that have been made by different speakers. But I would like to just mention a couple of points. Um, you know, in, in Europe, I think as you could hear from some of our speakers, we have been, and not just Europe, around the world, outside of Korea, we've been speaking about what we could do with and for Korea for many, many years. But this partnership has to, of course, include the Korean institutions, the government, and the civil society. And as we heard today, very um, uh, excitingly, I think, is the word from the youth and the fact that we would have this access to the youth uh, in Korea, in, even in this project, in the core of this project. It's a very significant step. Uh, I was really moved by the, um, uh, touched and actually encouraged by the words of uh, Ema Honorable Emanuela Del Rey, uh, and some of the points that she made, she talked about, uh, of course, we need to make, we need to create our partnership. We need to make our partnership uh, with strong women and men, but we uh, need to really look for, she, she used the word, uh, not just women because they are women, but the women who have this kind of like-minded thinking, quality women, actually, as another one of our speakers said today, Mrs. Tocino, Honorable Tocino, and also from our men, male speakers, uh, Dr. Hong from representing the Korean government. Uh, we we're very, uh, also very encouraged and um, motivated to recognize that uh, there is an expectation that women can really make a difference. I have been working in Geneva, especially through the Human Rights Council for um, 20 something years. And we had, for some part of that time, we had the current, current foreign minister in Korea, Her Excellency Kyung Wa Kong, as Dep Deputy High Commissioner um, for Human Rights and other positions that she held during that time. And, I know her inclusion and her understanding of the importance of civil society and the importance of women, especially which she always spoke about, these could also potentially be very important partners for our project in Korea. Also, uh, finally, just to say again to our Dr. Grishting, Anna Grishting, who has really uh, given her whole heart and experience and expertise to really developing this idea and that uh, with whom we have hopes of really expanding this partnership step by step, bringing in, you know, that we need, we definitely need financial resources to do this. So we need to get in touch with, uh, you know, institutions and 
I think there are institutions, even in Geneva, but around the world, there are many who could be interested in really supporting us and helping us to develop actually this project. It's not finalized yet. It's still being developed. It's a, it's a work of art in process. So um, as a final note, I just want to again say thank you to all of our speakers, all of our translators, all of those who have been somehow in the process of organizing, uh, in the background, in the foreground, so many. It was an amazing, amazing teamwork. Uh, Lily, Gundaker, Victor, our, also our team, Mrs. Hinterleitner and Renata, and so many who are really helping us in different ways to really not only end here, but make sure that this uh, report can go out uh, a well-written report can go out and we can really, this can really have a snowball effect, as we would say, huh? because it really does seem to be an idea whose time has come. So thank you again and wishing you all the best for everything that you do. And yes, and Dr. Lan Yang Moon, it's so wonderful to see you live too, actually. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend and rest of your life. And I hope we can continue working together. Thank you.